How powerful are the three elven rings? How were they made, and why are they good, not evil, and under Sauron's control? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings in depth, as well as the best of other great fantasy and science fiction, like A Song of Ice and Fire and The Witcher. Welcome. Given how much we now know about the three elven rings of power, and the emphasis placed on them in various film and TV adaptations, it's curious to note that Tolkien originally used them as a rather secretive subplot in The Lord of the Rings. In fact, other than a conversation Frodo has with Galadriel and the odd hint here and there, many readers won't even have been aware of who held those rings or how important they were. We only see their owners fully revealed at the very end of the story. It's often lost amidst the emotion of Frodo, Bilbo, Gandalf and the rest sailing west, but Tolkien brings our attention to the three rings one after the other in that chapter – and it's supposed to be a moment of revelation for the reader, an explanation of why things turned out as they did, because those three people, Gandalf, Galadriel and Elrond, possessed those three rings, Naya, Nenya and Vilya. We read, And there, to Sam's wonder, rode Elrond and Galadriel. Elrond wore a mantle of grey and had a star upon his forehead, and a silver harp was in his hand, and upon his finger was a ring of gold with a great blue stone, Vilya, the mightiest of the three. But Galadriel sat upon a white palfrey and was robed all in glimmering white like clouds about the moon, for she herself seemed to shine with a soft light. On her finger was Nenya, the ring wrought of mithril that bore a single white stone flickering like a frosty star. As he turned and came towards them, Frodo saw that Gandalf now wore openly on his hand the third ring, Narya the Great, and the stone upon it was red as fire. Until then, they were kept secret. The fact that Gandalf now wore Narya openly means he hadn't previously, and when Frodo sees Nenya on Galadriel's finger in Lothlorien, she says that it is not permitted to speak of it, and Elrond could not do so, but it cannot be hidden from the ring-bearer that she held one of the three. But why? Why the secrecy? What powers did they have? And if these were Sauron's rings, why were their owners not under his control? Let's dig into the history and find out. The forging of the rings of power was a cunning plan by Sauron in the Second Age to try to gain control over the elves. He disguised himself as Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, and offered the elves knowledge and skills in crafting. Elrond, Gilgalad and Galadriel all variously refused his offer, not knowing who he was but sensing something wasn't right. But Celebrimbor, the elven mastersmith, took Anatar in and learned from him for three centuries. This was quite a long-term plan by Sauron. During that time, they forged the nine rings that ended up in the hands of humans and the seven which ended up with dwarven lords. But Sauron, needing a bit of space and secrecy to forge the one ring to control the others, for that was the plan, while wearing his ring he would be able to read and control the thoughts of the elves wearing the other rings, he nipped back to Mordor to make that, leaving Celebrimbor all alone, during which time he used the skills he had learned from Anatar to make three more rings of power, but this time without Anatar Sauron being a part of the process. At which point, with the forging of the One Ring and Sauron attempting to use its power, the elves of Aregion finally realised what was happening. They took off the rings and Celebrimbor sought advice from Galadriel. She recommended destroying all the rings, but Celebrimbor couldn't bring himself to do that destroying his masterpieces, so he gave one of the three he had forged on his own to Galadriel to keep safe, and the other two went to Gilgalad, who passed one of them on to Círdan. When Sauron invaded Oregion and captured Celebrimbor, demanding he hand over the rings, Celebrimbor eventually had to give up the sixteen, but refused to say where the three final elven rings were. To bring the story up to date, Gilgalad gave his one to Elrond, and Círdan gave his to Gandalf when he appeared in Middle-earth in the Third Age. So by the time of the Lord of the Rings, that's where they are, with Gandalf, Elrond, and Galadriel. 
So the first important point here is that the three were forged using the same skills and magical technology that Anatar, Sauron, had taught Celebrimbor, but without his personal involvement in the forging. That's how they can be good and not corrupt whoever wears them. But because they were still forged using Sauron's magical technology, they retained some of the characteristics of the other 16. Basically, the way Sauron taught Celebrimbor to make rings of power contained a secret link to the One Ring. How exactly? We're not told, but it was definitely there. The three elven rings might be capable of being used positively, but they are still linked to Sauron and the One Ring. And so, if Sauron used the One Ring, he could see the thoughts of those that wore the three. That's why the elves did not wear the rings while Sauron had the One Ring. But once the ring had been lost, they all felt able to put them on and use their powers. So for most of the Second Age, the Elves did not wear the Three, but in the Third Age, they did. The link between the Three and the One can be seen all over the place when you start looking for it. It's how Frodo the Ringbearer can see Galadriel's ring on her finger when no one else can, and it's why when the One Ring is destroyed, the Three also lose their power. And in case you were wondering, Frodo could theoretically have tried to reach out and touch the thoughts of the bearers of the three elven rings when he wore the one ring. He even asks Galadriel about it. Her response is that by that point he had only worn it three times, and he would have to be wearing it to try, and he would have to actually try to bend his will to dominating others, and that as the rings only gave power to the measure of their possessor, he would fall short and it would destroy him. In short, it was good that he had never tried. Another interesting difference between these three rings and many of the others is that whereas the one ring makes its wearer invisible, the three rings, when worn, can make themselves invisible, or perhaps their users can make them invisible. That's why we never hear a description of Gandalf's ring through the story, or Elrond's. People can't see them. As we've already noted, when the Fellowship makes their way to Lothlorien and meets Galadriel, Frodo does see the ring, Nenya, on Galadriel's finger, but she says this is only possible because he is both the ring-bearer and has seen the Eye of Sauron, underlining once more the link between the Three Rings and the One Ring. Poor Sam can't see it at all. So that's the background, but what powers do they each have? Celebrimbor made them from different materials and gave each of them different powers, and in each case these were important, vital even to the story, though their effects are often hidden from most people's eyes. One was associated with fire, one water, and one air. Let's start with Gandalf's ring, Naya, the ring of fire with its red stone. As we saw earlier, it was entrusted by Gilgalad to Círdan, the elf lord who watched over the Grey Havens, and he gave it to Gandalf. We get this account of him handing it over in the appendices to the Lord of the Rings. Círdan later surrendered his ring to Mithrandir. For Círdan saw further and deeper than any other in Middle-earth, and he welcomed Mithrandir at the Grey Havens, knowing whence he came and whither he would return. Take this ring, master, he said, for your labours will be heavy, but it will support you in the weariness that you have taken upon yourself, for this is the ring of fire, and with it you may rekindle hearts in a world that grows chill. Rekindling hearts in a world that grows chill is a wonderful phrase. It suggests that the main magic around this ring is one of encouragement, putting hope in people's hearts, helping them resist tyranny and despair. This is one of those things that is hard to see most of the time, but it's easy to acknowledge that Gandalf is a strengthening and reassuring presence throughout The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and just look at how despairing everyone was when he was lost fighting that Balrog. Yes, they'd just lost a valuable member of the team, but it was more than that. It was as if something even more powerful had been taken from them. Aragorn even says, we must do without hope, as if Gandalf was the one who brought hope. That hope and encouragement also seems to have aided Gandalf himself personally, giving him resistance to the weariness of time. As we see, Gandalf does not tire or waver in his task in Middle-earth as, say, Saruman does, despite many setbacks. This is despite the fact that Gandalf never asked for this mission in the first place and was afraid of Sauron. 
It's a curious detail in Gandalf's background, but we never even see a hint of it in the main stories, perhaps due to Naya's encouraging magic. And though I covered it in much more detail in my How Powerful is Gandalf video, it's undeniable that Gandalf, with the Ring of Fire, does specialise in fire magic, whether that's fireworks to entertain hobbits, hurling fiery pine cones at wolves, or defending himself from the Nazgul at Weathertop with light and flame. The second ring, Nenya, the Ring of Water, was given by Celebrimbor to Galadriel, and she kept it throughout the ages. We're told that it was made of mithril, with a white stone made of adamant set into it. Frodo sees it on Galadriel's hand after looking in her mirror, and we read this. So bright was the star above that the figure of the elven lady cast a dim shadow on the ground. Its rays glanced upon a ring about her finger. It glittered like polished gold overlaid with silver light, and a white stone in it twinkled as if the even star had come down to rest upon her hand. We're told that it has powers of preservation, protection and concealment from evil, and Galadriel used it to protect and preserve Lothlorien. The bit about protection isn't so much about military protection. Elrond was clear that that was not the purpose of any of the Three Rings, and Lothlorien did get raided by orcs and the like from time to time, but it did seem to hide it from the gaze of would-be invaders and shroud it from Sauron himself. Galadriel seems to have used this power to make Lothlorien beautiful and peaceful and everything a community of elves should be. This, of course, explains how Lothlorien appears so ethereal, so serene, so beautiful, more so even than Rivendell and much more so than the Woodland Realm, say. Nenya is playing its part to preserve the elves and their life in Middle-earth far beyond what it would otherwise be. One by one, the elves are feeling the call to head west to Valinor. Their time in Middle-earth is coming to an end. The time of humanity is about to begin, but Lothlorien is a shining beacon defying this tide through the power of the Ring Nenya. This, of course, adds a tragic twist to Galadriel helping Frodo and the Fellowship on their way, for if the One Ring is destroyed, as per the plan, Nenya's power, as with all of the other rings of power, would come to an end, and Lothlorien would fade. She tells Frodo as much. Do you not see now, wherefore your coming is to us as the footsteps of doom? For if you fail, then we are laid bare to the enemy. Yet if you succeed, then our power is diminished, and Lothlorien will fade, and the tides of time will sweep it away. We must depart into the west, or dwindle to a rustic folk of Delon Cave, slowly to forget and to be forgotten. It is a melancholy thought, and it is indeed what happened. After the ring was destroyed, Nenya lost its power and Lothlorien faded. Its people left one after the other. It fell deserted and ruined, left to the forest. We last hear of it in the year 121 of the Fourth Age, when after Aragorn's death, Arwen goes there to die. And as the Ring of Water we should probably also acknowledge that one of Galadriel's most powerful magical items was the Mirror of Galadriel, a basin of water through which you can see the past, present and future. Impressive magic. The third ring is Vilja, the Ring of Air. This was the ring that Celebrimbor gave to Gilgalad, and Gilgalad then gave to Elrond. So Elrond had it and was using its power all the way through the Third Age, including, of course, the main stories of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. We're told that Vilja was made of gold and had a large blue stone set into it. It was the mightiest of the Three Rings, which is probably fitting given that it was held originally by Gilgalad, the Lord of the High Elves and King of the Eldar. But unlike the other two rings, we are never specifically told what powers it actually had. We're left to see what Elrond does and impute backwards what the ring's powers might be. Well, to an extent, it seems to have had some of the same powers of the other two rings. In the Silmarillion, Rivendell is described as a refuge for the weary and the oppressed, and a treasury of good counsel and wise law. This sounds a lot like how Gandalf uses Naya to give hope and encouragement to those who need it, and as with Nenya and Lothlorien, once Vilja had ceased to work with the destruction of the One Ring, 
Rivendell also fell slowly to ruin, as if the magic preserving it had died. By the year 120 of the Fourth Age, Aragorn said to Arwen that none now walk in the gardens of Elrond. But it's perhaps in the power of healing that we see its greatest strength. We are told that Celebrimbor forged the Three Rings to help heal and preserve. We've seen the preserving aspect of this a lot. All three rings are united by their ability to preserve and encourage in some way. But the healing aspect is perhaps strongest in Vilja. Elrond is acknowledged in Gandalf's words as the master of healing. This is probably best seen in how he heals Frodo's wound from the Morgul blade. Aragorn instantly realises that he cannot heal Frodo. Glorfindel admits that it is beyond his abilities, and even Gandalf, that beacon of hope and encouragement, admits that when he saw the wound, he had little hope that Frodo would survive. But Elrond does heal him. There's also probably an element here of Vilja granting magical control over air, as it is the Ring of Air. Narya supports Gandalf's fire magic, Nenya supports Galadriel's mirror, so it makes sense that Vilja does support Elrond in some air magic, even if we don't see it. Perhaps when the river comes crashing down on the Black Riders outside Rivendell, that was caused by the wind rather than just water magic. We don't know. So we have three rings that are powerful, tied to the one ring, but opposite it in many ways. The one ring and the other rings Sauron had a hand in forging for that matter, were all about power, Sauron's power, and the individual power of whoever wore those rings. The three elven rings were made to help others, not those who wore them, healing, encouragement, and preserving. And it is not a coincidence, I'm sure, that the three who wore those rings were the three who took on the mantle of guiding and protecting and pushing Frodo in the right way. Gandalf trusting Frodo as the ring-bearer at the start of the journey, Elrond commissioning him to take it to Mordor, and Galadriel gifting him and Sam the tools they needed to finish the job. The three of them also seem to be the ones who, while everyone else is arguing about what should be done, seem to sense something of the future for Frodo and the Fellowship, and what was to happen with the One Ring. Elrond says that, I think this task was appointed for you, Frodo, and that if you do not find a way, no one will. Gandalf tells Frodo that he was meant to have the ring, and Galadriel gives Frodo the file of light from Erendil's star, so he would have that when all other lights go out. Given it saved his life more than once, it is a prescient gift. But most of all, Tolkien uses these three rings to underline one of the central themes of The Lord of the Rings. The way to confront the power-hungry is not to also be power-hungry, but to be its opposite, to prioritise helping others. Some of the most powerful and important magic that happens anywhere in The Lord of the Rings happens so subtly through these rings that many readers don't ever realise it is happening. The first readers of The Lord of the Rings might not have even realised that Elrond and Gandalf had rings of power until the closing pages of the book. The most powerful don't need to show off their power, and they definitely don't need to use it to gain even more power for themselves. If you'd like to see more videos on the world of J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, there's a link to my playlist on the left of your screen. Or if you'd like to support this channel, thank you. There's a link to my Patreon page on the right of the screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.